so want to respect everybody's time. Um, Olga Martin is here mm -hmm. from Business Buildery, and I'm going to let her talk about her business. But first, if everybody can introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get started. Mm. Uh, well, Olga, thank you for joining us. Sure, today. my pleasure. Um, nice so, to meet all of you. Um, Olga has a varied background. <laughs> for 20 years in business. Yes. Um, lots of different areas that you have experience in. So we're very excited to hear your story and mm -hmm. um, also be open to questions. So the floor awesome. is yours. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, I don't have any slides this morning. I figured, you know, we'll just have a conversation and I'll tell you a bit about myself and then we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, as Amy said, I have a very varied background and that's to put it mildly. Um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur ever since I was remember. And I, I, I can remember and um, Fear has stopped me for years and years. And um, I went the corporate route. I, you know, was a consultant, then I was a project manager. Um, then I went to get my PhD in marketing at the University of Washington, taught marketing there. Then I came to Nebraska again, um, worked with the governor as deputy director of communications for the state. So I handled all the media relations and all that. I started a pie bakery business. <laughs> I was a pie baker with sensational pies. Um, I haven't baked since. <laughs> But they were very good pies, and I realized how hard of a job that is. I am now so sympathetic, anybody who is in the food industry, um, because that is relentless. I mean, nothing ever stops. Um, I was a marketing consultant for a few years. That was sort of a side hustle for me. And finally, I'm... Um, the owner of Business Buildery. And so so how I started Business Buildery is um, it's sort of, I was telling Amy earlier that it's a new business. I started it last, or this January is when it became official. And the reason, and initially it was going to be a coaching practice for new entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs to help them figure out what to do next, to help them figure out their marketing strategy and so forth. Because I do have so many different ex experience and so many dif different facets of a business. Um, and as I started getting my coaching clients, they would come to me and I would give them all this brilliant advice mm -hmm. and all these brilliant tips and all these wonderful things that, you know, we'd decide that they would do next and they would come back two weeks later and nothing was done. Nothing was done. And, and so finally I had a candid conversation with one of my clients. She was on this, I called it a starter package. So it was a three months coaching starter package where you know she would learn what needs to be done and we'd plan her business out and then she'd go and do it and about a month or two a little bit more two months into it I said would you rather take that money and put it towards a website you know that somebody else would do for you or your social media management or something and she just looked at me and she's like is that possible and I said well heck you know I'm not seeing any results from coaching and I need to see results um, personally I don't like my clients come uh, coming to me and you know we have this awesome time together with wine and coffee usually and you know all these conversations and stories about business and all these plans and nothing would get done so so I sat down and planned Business Buildery to be actually about building businesses. So, um, so what are the components that a business needs to set the foundation for basic operations? What are the components that a business needs you know, to create a solid marketing strategy that will actually take you from point A to point B. What needs to be done, you know, after you get on social media? Like what what are the next steps? How do you know what content to post? All these different things. And then when you 
have those pieces together, then you actually have somebody to do it for you, which is what my company is. And so we work exclusively with small businesses. Um, we help, it's a one-stop shop pretty much for digital marketing, um, strategy and planning. And so it's ambitious. There are a lot of different parts involved. Um, it's still evolving mm -hmm. big time. Um, I'm realizing that a lot of my services are too expensive for a lot of business owners as well. Um, so I'm, I have this curriculum of courses that I'm planning to actually have a hands-on practical both experience and learning um, for students. Um, I'm not, you know, I taught at the university. I'm not interested in the same type of education that a university would provide, which is very broad and very general and very rarely hands-on. Um, when I taught my students, we, ha we did everything <laughs> hands-on because that's the only, I feel like, the only real learning happens when you're actually doing something through experience. Um, so this is what my, my curriculum, um, starting in January, I have four, four workshops, I call them. They're six-week workshops. Um, and I'm not calling them courses because, you know, we'll be writing business plans, we'll be writing marketing plans will be setting up social media and posting content and all that fun stuff. So um, so that's where I'm at. Um, a little bit about me and I've, yeah. So um, what motivates you, Olga? Like you talked about that you've gone through various <laughs> adventures or you've yes. tried different things and your business now is currently evolving. So what what motivates you? What what drives you? Ideas. Okay. Um, I'm a big idea person. I have files and folders and notes on my phone of ideas for products for um, for the next thing. You know, I'm for my clients. I have folders and folders of ideas for my clients um, constantly. You know, this is how we can do your marketing strategy here. This is, you know, have you thought about this target audience for your business? Have you thought about the how to pivot this product? to this market, you know, because positioning is so huge in business. I mean, the same product could be presented to 10 different target audiences and be, and play a completely different role in their lives. Um, so, so yeah, ideas, um, and then figuring out how to do it, um, which is more ideas, right? So um, I've been reading this book on re listening to it on repeat and reading it on repeat. It's called Obstacle is the Way. Um, and it's a book that just helped me reframe my thinking about challenges. Um, it's based on Stoic philosophy. Um, so Marcus Aurelius, uh, that's his quote, you know, obstacle is the way. And instead of looking at a challenge, like I don't even call them problems anymore. They're all challenges. Um, instead of looking at a challenge as a problem, we look at it as the way, like a challenge is actually a hint from the universe to me from God, because I'm also a Christian, um, which way to go next. And so, so instead of, you know, before in business, if I had a problem or a challenge or an issue, I would freak out and I'm like, oh, it's too difficult. I can't handle this anymore, you know? And so, and I just, I mean, it was so easy to just stop and it would paralyze me for a while. And so it, it would take things away. Now I actually, I'm starting to get excited when problems arise because it makes my decision making super easy. It's like, oh, I know what to do next, you know? It just makes it super easy to follow the path and you still have your goals, but you know how to approach them. You know, you know which way to go next. So, so if money is the problem, you know, let's figure that out. If, if you don't have sales, let's figure that out. And so, and you just, I mean, the book talks about sticking with the process and just chiseling away you know, just chiseling the way at the problem and not letting it stop you. But yeah. that is a mindset change, mm -hmm. right? So that's mm -hmm. not, you didn't go from freaking out to seeing <laughs> this as an opportunity no. overnight. But that, 
so years. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. <laughs> well, again, that's changing how you had thought for years about mm -hmm. that. And we talk a lot about the entrepreneurial mindset and how important that is, and that's one of what we believe believe are the core values is yes. being able to deal with uncertainty and being okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to work through that, so. Um. And embracing it. Now, I mean, the way I see obstacles now is that not only is it not an impediment to my future success, but it is literally the way. Like, this is literally the way. You know, um, like money is always a problem in a, in a new business, in small business, hiring people, I want the new app for this and the new tool for that and all these different things I want to do and constantly thinking about, okay, how do I allocate the budget for this or that? And it's just, and now it's like, maybe I figure out a different way. You know, you just, you're looking for solutions and the focus is never on the problem. Once you know the problem, you just, you don't dwell on it. You just, you're just, the radar is, okay, let's figure out what types of solutions we have. Some solutions are not gonna be appropriate for you or you know, too much risk, but this is where you gotta know what's, what you can handle, how much risk you can handle. Can you handle you know, taking a second mortgage on your house to fund your business? That's not for everyone. Okay, if you can't, what can you do? What are the options? Are there grants? Okay. Can you know? Can you find a grant? Can you? Find, would you be okay with a business loan? No. Okay. You know, and, and so you just go through the solutions. And so I'm seeing my business as I do it more and more with clients, as just helping people with obstacles, pretty much. I mean, because that's what entrepreneurship is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Just overcoming one obstacle after the next, and if it, and we always say if it was easy, everybody. Would yes. Do it, right? Yeah. And it sounds really like you you utilize your strengths mm -hmm. you with your clients when you talk about um, being liking ideas and being motivated by ideas mm -hmm. and solutions. So that's great to see that you're using what drives you and what yes. motivates you naturally um, to help your, your clients. Oh, absolutely. And you know, um, years ago when I worked, um, I worked for waste management as an internal auditor. I was recruited right out of college and um, had to wear steel toe boots. <laughs> that, was, that was unique. Um, but I worked with them for two years and it was, a two, it was two years of travel. It was a traveling job. So, you know, being right out of college, that was fine by me and it was a lot of fun. Um, and, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. And during, <laughs> Um, and during our corporate training, we had like this big department training for one week in Houston. And it was the first time anybody flew me out, you know, paid for my ticket, picked me out from the airport in a limo. And I was 20 at the time, so I was like, oh my gosh, this is, wow. I was just blown away. And I show up with these two gigantic suitcases, bigger than me for one week. And all these other auditors are you know, with their little carry-on <laughs> luggage. <laughs> and I remember the VP of audit, I'll get to my point, I promise. But the VP of audit saw me with my gigantic suitcases rolling them behind me and she said, we're gonna talk about your luggage at this training. <laughs> um, but anyway, one of the things that they taught us was um, the strength finder. Yes. Um, Strength Finder book, and we did the whole big test, you know, for the strengths. And I tell you, 20 years later, I'm still using that knowledge, and it was so handy to me. Um, but I actually was thinking this morning how I have been focusing on my strengths for 20 years, and I'm just now learning that I'm actually, I mean, it's great, and I think that's the right way to go. But once you've mastered your strengths, I feel like obstacles are a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. And it's just using your strengths to overcome obstacles and focusing on needs. You know, by now I know some things within me that 
I've wanted to change for a long time, and it's not gonna happen. Right. It's just, this is my personality, this is how I was made, and this is, it's not gonna happen. So instead of looking at it as something that needs to be changed, I now work with those traits, you know? Um, and there is fun in that, yeah. Yeah, we, um, in our culture, Sorry, we, so focus on, <laughs> we focus on, uh, we start out with strengths. And mm -hmm. uh, really focus on do what you're naturally strong mm -hmm. with. Um, so we'll probably cut this out and probably yeah. use it as an exercise. <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect example of yeah. um, don't dwell on the things that you do you're not naturally talented mm -hmm. in, but really I agree. on the things that you mm -hmm. are, even though you have to do the other things and that's okay. Yes. Um, really set yourself up mm -hmm. for success. Yeah. And um, so we're glad to hear that you yeah, can Thank you. This. Absolutely. Yeah, and I highly, I've recommended it over the years to so many people. And when I worked, um, I worked in IT as a project manager for a while and at one point, my team was 65 people, and I was 24 years old at the time, so um, I was the youngest person on the team, and, and I remember being so unsure of myself. You know, these people have been doing their jobs for a lot longer. I didn't know anything about IT either. <laughs> and, um, and, and I remember, you know, actually having my team take the strength finder test as well and and recommending it to them and it was helpful it was helpful for all of us to see that we all have our individual strengths and as a team you know those those can complement each other so much and we shouldn't dwell you know somebody is a bad communicator so let them be you know right. but he's a great programmer he's great with understanding requirements he's great of turning a customer's request into something that looks amazing on the computer screen. And that is, you know, I don't care if he can't talk to clients, you know, I'll talk to clients. <laughs> just do your job and be happy, you know. And so it's just pick, picking your battles, I think. That's what, that's what it comes down to, yeah, so. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned one book that mm -hmm. you, um, refer to that you read over. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there other books or podcasts that you would recommend? Can I pull up my phone? Because yeah. I have a ton. <laughs> I'm, I walk my dog a lot, so I listen to podcasts and audiobooks all the time. That's, that's what I listen to. Um, the book before the obstacle is the way that is actually um, was I mean, so, so my PhD is in consumer behavior, so I took all the PhD level psychology courses. I'm familiar with psychology. This book was written by a psychologist who is such a brilliant, has the most profound understanding of fear I have ever heard. And she's brilliant in a way she presents it. I mean, it's deceptively simple. The, the obstacle is the way after her book seemed like a bunch of mumbo jumbo of long <laughs> words, because it's all this stoic philosophy and this and that. This book, it's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, is the simplest language in a book that I think I could ever read while still delivering the content in such a profound way. I listened to it. I listened to it twice um, and highly recommend. And I mean, the title of the book says it all, but she has practical exercises and all this. And if you, if you can get past the initial simplicity of her approach, um, it's a really amazing book. And especially if you know the background of that she's coming from yes. the research. Right? Yes, exactly. Oh, she, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, then. Um, the Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, I think everybody knows uh, in here. Never Split the Difference, that's the best book on negotiation. And, oh man, that book, I keep, I think every two years I listen to it again, just because, it, I mean, it's brilliant. It's the best book on negotiation and communications. Um, 
for podcasts. Uh, let me see, where are my podcasts? Sorry, I reorganized my phone, so I can't find anything. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, so my podcasts are pretty eclectic. Um, I listen to the Tim Ferriss show. I like Tim Ferriss. My First Million is a very entertaining entrepreneurship show. They have such great practical tips for entrepreneurs, and they ask the dumb questions. Um, so they have all these brilliant entrepreneurs come to their show, and they would just ask them flat out. So you have all these rental properties. Where did you come up with the money to buy them? Right. You know, just like straight up. And they're like, oh, my dad gave me a little bit. My aunt came up with some. I took out a business loan. And they're like, OK, OK, wasn't that too much risk for you? <laughs> and you know, and they talk about it. Like, what was the interest rate? You know, how did you plan on paying it back? And all this stuff, like concrete stuff, which is what I love. And I think that's about the only thing that matters when we talk about business. Um, is the practical because um, business is about action, right? So I like the hidden brain. I think that's an NPR uh, podcast. So they talk about how our brains work, oh, okay. um, the psychology of the psychology and the chemistry of the brain, and just different um, different various ways you can work with your own brain to help yourself either do something or feel better or whatnot, you know. We just came from a conference and we went to a couple different sessions that specifically mm -hmm. talked about brain health mm -hmm. and um, how we can help ourselves, but also how we can help our students. Yeah. Given that um, they have different stressors and different mm -hmm. environments than maybe what we had when we were in college mm -hmm. and the demographic of our students has changed. Absolutely, so, yeah. I'm amazed with the new generation. I feel like they're so much more advanced than I ever was at their age. They're just beyond, yeah. just beyond. And that's because of mm -hmm. what they've grown up with. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we advocate, let's not put them in a box. Mm -hmm. that, that's not how yes. they work. They yes. work outside of the box. Yes, so exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I love the outside the box thinking, yeah. And they're just so much more in tune with their emotions and I feel, you know, and it's just like, just the sensitivity level to how other people feel is like here. But at the same time, they're advocating for themselves, which I didn't do. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I was recruited for an internal auditor job, you know, at a conference when I was in college and not even 21 yet and I was so excited and I thought well this is my job you know this is what I'm gonna do and then after two years of non-stop travel that got to be enough so so I took the next job that somebody gave me and, and it was sort of like you know I was just thankful for that one so mm -hmm. yeah all right well um, those are the questions I had Bill, do you have a question already? <laughs> um, so, tell us a little bit more about the business buildery. Uh, I love the name, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not a word person, I'm a numbers person. Yeah. I don't have to screw up with the name of anything. I've been <laughs> um, but uh, you said starting off as a, as a coaching. So, obviously, uh, with a PhD, you have uh, a vast amount of knowledge in a subject. Um, uh, you, know, you said consumer consumer behavior. Consumer mm -hmm. behavior. Um, I think a lot of us in this, you know, we're here to build something outside the box. Mm -hmm. I, my specifically, I want to build an insurance agency. Mm -hmm. But I have I have different mentors that I that I look at and I talk to, but there's no here's step one, step two, step three, step mm -hmm. four, you know, you know, first you need to recruit 20 people or yeah. 20 people or a mm -hmm. person. Um, so that, that part of it is, is kind of a mystery to me, but the, the bottom line is, if you talk about, you know, 
know, root cause, which is what I used to do in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is you have to get it enough front of enough people. Yeah. The, bo the bottom line is, is you have to have somebody in front of you to talk to. Mm -hmm. So that gets us back into this marketing. Uh, and I actually started doing some social media stuff. Uh, and I've got a couple of, uh, actually a couple of descriptions planned out. Uh, I was hoping to get to this week, but I'll probably be this weekend before I you know. um, is that is the social media aspect actually something that works if you don't have a physical product? I, don't know, I mean, I have a physical. I have a shirt. Mm -hmm. I don't have something you can like click on for nine ninety nine and have it shipped to your house. Mm -hmm. Well, I think any tool works. <laughs> cliche if you work it. <laughs> um, so social media, I think, is great for any product, physical or not. Um, and I feel like it's even more so for services, right, for, for products that people can't feel and touch, because that's where you get to actually tell them what they're missing, right? Tell them how your product solves their pain. Um, and social media provides a platform, I feel like, for telling the story, what your product is about. For my services as well, you know, there's very little pictures I can put up as to, here's what your business will look like. You know, I provide services, so I can't show people, but I'm constantly thinking about, okay, if I'm providing a business plan template, let's create a cover, you know, that we can use in various, um, to show people something on social media, on the website, you know. Um, for your product as well, think about what's the visual that you want people to associate with your product. Is it a secure future? Is it, you know, you see those commercials for insurance and it's a happy family with a roof over, the, over their head, you know, tornado blows off their roof, but they're still happy because they have this great insurance product, you know, and whatnot. So it's just, for you, you may focus on a certain, you know, depending on who your target audience is, because we always come back to who is your client. Who are you after for, to be your client? And the more specific you can get with that, the more specific you can be um, in your messaging, right? And so, so start there, um, because there is no point in starting a social media for everyone. I think that's just a waste of time. If you have, and I mean, you have to know whether your clients are on social media, what social media platforms they're on the most. Is it LinkedIn? Is it Instagram? Is it Facebook? You know, because if you're going after, um, you know, a demographic that hardly is ever on Instagram, there is no point for you to be there. That's just a waste of time. If your demographic is on Instagram, what topics are they looking up? Are they looking up topics related to health, to travel? Um, house decor, um, fashion, you know, all these different things, you can start speaking their language. Um, and when you speak their language, then, then your content starts to resonate. Um, the one thing about social media that I tell my clients and that I remind myself as well is that it takes time um, to do it organically. So if you're, not go if you're not going to supplement your organic you know, content posting um, with ads, then brace yourself for it to take some time before people start following you and sharing your content. Um, and so, I mean, Instagram algorithm, for example, I work a lot with Instagram. That seems to be the platform for most of my clients. Um, changes so much. I mean, it's just what worked three months ago wouldn't work today. But that is only if you focus on the algorithm. If you focus on all these, I call them cheap marketing tactics, you know, dictated by external forces that are outside of our control, then you're dependent on, on the algorithm because your content is dependent on the algorithm. So, so right now, you know, if there's, a if there's a cinnamon challenge happening and you want to jump on the bandwagon, you're most likely too late for that because there is a million influencers with a lot more posts with the cinnamon challenge than you will ever have. Um, 
But if you're doing your authentic content, knowing who you're talking to, speaking their language, using the phrases that they find relatable, that they understand, um, under talking to them in a way that you show them that you understand their pain, you understand what problem you're solving for them, then you'll slowly start building your audience. And eventually, you know, that's, that's how you get established on social media, so. But it's work, consistency is the key, um, is the key on, on social media. Posting regularly, whether it's twice a week or three times a month, just do it consistently. Um, that, that brings up an interesting mm -hmm. the, There are some people who have the theory that you can never post too much. Yeah. And other people have what you're saying there is just be consistent with it. Good content is better than a bunch of gibberish. Yes. Um, I know some people in my, I do, I do life and health insurance. Mm -hmm. And there's one guy that in particular in my group or that does what I do. Uh, he's in works in um, he posts probably three times a day. Mm -hmm. He has something in the neighborhood of like five or six thousand TikTok videos. Out mm -hmm. there. Wow! It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of good information mm -hmm. that out there. But there's five thousand videos, so it's like okay, you know, and Matt's a great guy. Don't get me wrong, but it's like okay, Matt, mm -hmm. which one of these videos do I need to watch to learn what? I need to <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that oversaturating what you're trying, the message that you're getting at? Because that's the way I see it, but I'm not the expert. Well, um, you can never post too much good content, but it's really hard to produce good content. That's why usually, you know, usually you come up with a schedule that works for you, um, and that's when you post. Um, so, so if it takes you, you know, it takes me a long time to produce a good piece of content and you know so so I work with that you know if I write an article it takes me a week to write an article I post once a week um, right now I'm not really for my own business I'm not prioritizing social media as much to me it's about um, reaching out one-on-one -on -one to people um, and building connections that way for the type of product I have. As I start pushing out courses, that's where social media will come in handy because courses, I can accommodate a lot more people, first of all, in my, you know, in my business. And so, so you gotta think about, again, your goals and the, what you can do and work with those parameters. So, so if he posts 5,000, I mean, as a rule of thumb, um, and I'm seeing a lot of influencers and you know people with large followings on Instagram doing this is recycling content every three months. So so you know you put a different graphic on it, you put a little sli slightly different spin. So usually it's not straight copy paste, but you adapt the content. And usually after you've posted it once, you want to do something different next time because you see a different angle or slightly would like to rephrase some things and whatnot so um so for my clients you know what i usually recommend is doing two three months of very fresh very on brand content and then recycling it afterwards um, so that way you don't spend all your time and money, you know. In my case, people would pay me f to manage their social media. You don't spend all your money on constantly having to push out new content, um, but rather reusing the the things you have, especially educational content. I mean, if you have three months of everyday posting, that's 90 pieces of amazing information about your product or amazing educational content that people will learn about insurance and whatnot. So. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 You just said that courses versus workshops. Mm -hmm. And I taught for 11 years at SCC. So mm -hmm. I thought, oh, you know, this is going to be so easy. Yeah. I can do courses <laughs> But then you hear a lot about um, don't do courses. And of course, it's advertisements for mm -hmm. you to do something different. Mm -hmm. So obviously, they're not going to promote no, what I know. you're doing. 
but between courses and workshops, what would you say for coaching? Is it mm -hmm. to do maybe one or over the other? Well, so I teach people how to build businesses, right? So it's very hands-on. Um, it's a very hands-on thing, so I don't want them to walk away with a bunch of theory. Um, for you, though, um, helping you know women deal with court abuse and whatnot, it just depends what kind of information you have. If the information you have is mostly just information and knowledge that you need to pass on, you know, to them, then a course I think is a great format. Um, if it's something to do with filling out a million forms, for example, I would do it as a workshop. You know, have them bring all their forms that they need to fill out and you just walk from person to person and, you know, help them fill them out or something. Um, so it just depends. So maybe not workshop because mine are all like basically not only <coughs> or is someone paying for them a lot of times mm -hmm. so it doesn't show up that they're getting coached. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have to make phone calls when they know the other person is at home. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if getting more of them together is more on a one-on-one. -on -one. So maybe that would be a course instead. Do you, you mean like in person or happen. you do everything in person? No, I do. Well, I started when COVID. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it worked perfect mm -hmm. because it was better for them to do a phone call at home. Yeah. Work. Mm -hmm. on their cell phone. Mm -hmm. Now I'm starting to get people that want to actually come in physically, mm -hmm. but not all my clients are in Lincoln. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've got people from all over the United States. Mm -hmm. I really get them all in the same room. Yeah, so, uh, so is your question about how do they pay for it without um, their spouse noticing or? No, just what maybe would it be better if they just did like an individual course, and that way they don't have to mm -hmm. meet other people. Oh, like a pre-recorded mm -hmm. versus live. Oh, absolutely. I think I think there's so much value in pre-recording. Um, one for you, it saves your time. You know, um, because once, especially if again the content doesn't really necessitate for you to have to answer questions live, which you can still do. Um, so one format I really like is pre-recording or doing the, doing the, cur the course for the first time live, recording it, then making it available to people, and then having it, so whoever takes your course next, they might have the ability to have a chat with you, you know, schedule a time to actually have a chat with you in case they have any questions. Yeah, that's one idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just finished reading Tom Rath Vital Friends. I brought the book. If anyone wants to borrow it, I'm through with it, so we're free to have it. Yeah. Uh, he talks about uh, how a friendship in the workplace. I know you're an entrepreneur, so maybe you're your worker, your employee. Mm -hmm. He gets into, you know, is this person an energizer, this person a uh, communicator, a uh, connector? Um, so he gets into the different kinds of uh, uh, benefits that a, a, a friend, a best friend has in the workplace with engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, does that, is that uh, in your experience, uh, something that's true? Do you have a best friend at work or? <laughs> Well, um, my best friend and I actually started a business together a few years ago. It was a skincare company. I don't talk about it very much because then COVID started, so it didn't go anywhere. But we had a website and a line of skincare we designed. My dream is to go back to it someday. I think, um, so in general, I am not a big fan of partnerships in business um, because that can ruin friendships. Uh, in my case, my best friend and I actually had a conversation before we started, and we agreed that friendship will always come first. So if the business isn't working, we're going to abandon the business um, and save our friendship. Um, as far as my corporate experience and working in an office and having friends, I think that makes a huge difference. I always had a 
office bestie. <laughs> um, and I think it makes such a such a big difference in terms of being motivated to come to work every day, you know, staying at the office later than necessary. I feel like it made me a better and more productive uh, person to work with. And actually, there is research I read um, about a year ago by, I think, LinkedIn, maybe, um, that looked at why people quit their jobs. And the number one reason was because they didn't have a friend in the office. Number one reason, and I have goosebumps. Um, and now I'm, and ever since I read that research, I was like, gosh, I started looking, you know, at where people live and where people communicate, like where people congregate, you know, if they have somebody like a coffee shop. They know the barista, you know, they come in, they have, they know a few details about that person, the other, you know, they can check in, they can ask follow-up questions. The odds of that person coming back to that coffee shop are so much greater. And, and you know, my, my um, one of my research papers that I wrote in the PhD program was on loyalty, um, brand loyalty, and what makes people loyal consumers and loyal customers. And I think this friendship piece makes a huge difference, the personal connection. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. So are you familiar with Jamie Kern-Lima? Mm -mm. She's one that started her own makeup business. Mm -hmm. She's got an amazing journey, and she's got a couple books out. I'm reading her. Oh, is that the It Cosmetics? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I love her. I'm wearing her makeup today. <laughs> Well, she sold it, but yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she's still in control of it, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I haven't read her first one. I'm reading her worthy right now. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I love her. Every talk with her. She's so good. She's got a podcast now, too. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll, I'll add it to my list. <laughs> she interviewed Oprah. Oprah was her first interviewee. Wow. Podcast, so oh, my gosh. Oh, I'll have to listen. So your courses, I love that idea because I love self-education. Mm -hmm. Because you can make money in it, you know, because people buy your courses. Mm -hmm. They're learning something. Yes. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. I called it the Business Builder School. Yeah. Any other questions for Olga? So when you're working with people to build their websites and that sort of thing, are you a specialist in any particular platforms? Because we have mm -hmm. certainly <coughs> businesses have different needs than a lot of the platforms that are coming online now. Yeah. We just finished a book doing Automate Your Busy Work that really talked a lot about all the different kinds of uh, tools that we have now. A lot mm -hmm. of um, people here use HubSpot, SEC uses HubSpot. Mm -hmm. um, are there platforms that you specialize in? So for building websites, um, I love Wix. Mm -hmm. My website is built on Wix um, and most of my clients. Um, the reason I like Wix is that it is very intuitive and easy to manage yourself, which most of my clients, you know, after I build a website for them, um, at first they, so we have the, so, Every client has the option of being trained on how to manage their website themselves. Um, for it's a two-hour training, and afterwards, you know, they don't have to depend on me and my business and paying a monthly maintenance fee. Um, and Wix is very easy for that. Um, I've worked with WordPress as well. That's so Wix and WordPress. I compare them as iPhone and Android. Android, you can do anything. But it's a little complicated and not very user friendly if you don't know what you're doing. Um, iPhone has these beautiful features and things, but if you want something very specific, you're going to have to find a workaround. It's possible, but you're going to have to find a workaround. And so, um, so WordPress is great for e-commerce. Shopify, I think, is number one um, for social media management. You know. Hootsuite, 
and all that. So yeah, we, we go back to some tools um, over and over, yeah. But for websites, I think Wix is the simplest. Mm -hmm. Is that what people are looking for, you think? Uh, well, people are looking for different things. <laughs> um, just depends, you know, some people want to be very hands off, in which case, depending on, so like one of my clients wanted to do courses, exclusively courses and memberships. For her, Kajabi is, you know, number one. Now, another client came to me, Kajabi is too expensive for her. It is an expensive platform. It's amazing, but it's very expensive. So then we go and, okay, let's think about Thinkific. Like there, there, is, there is a million other different platforms that are not as fancy, but less expensive to use. So it just depends. Depends on the budget, depends on what the person needs. Um, for Kajabi, you know, if all you plan to do is courses, it might be worth the investment. So. Um, so it just depends on. Yes, it's um, last time I looked, I think it was about three thousand a year or something. But you know, if if all you plan to do is courses, it might be worth the investment to just invest in Kajabi upfront, three thousand. You know, you'll have to design it as well. Um, but then you don't have to worry about migrating your content a year or two down the line and all your contacts stay in one place so you can do automated emails and every, everything is seamless, you know, all your marketing and everything. So it just depends on, the, on what your goals are. Anything else, you guys? Let, let me, can I ask a question? Sure, absolutely. Um, what motivates you guys to have a business? I mean, entrepreneurship is hard work. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's natural to some of us. I, mean, I, I, look, I look back at my, my family history and um, my, my dad was always self-employed, my grandfather was self-employed. Uh, on my mom's side, uh, they're all farmers, you know, that which is the ultimate self <laughs> Yes, yeah. <laughs> No, there's no other job where you, where you have to be a agronomist or marketer. Yeah, a mechanic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally all of them yes. are wrapped into one crazy job. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's just something that, you know, was there. Yeah. Um, and then people in our generation, uh, we're raised by people like, you know, the, the, the post-World War II get into the 60s and 70s, everybody got that factory job, and then I think that's where a lot of things changed for mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially in this area, um, where it was like, you know, you got to go get a good job. Yes. Mm-hmm. Family. Yeah. I think that kind of took away from a mentality for a lot of people, but I, I still think it's there for a lot of people, especially in this room, uh, very obvious in a lot of people that sort of have that spirit. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. For me, it's uh, changing the past, you know. I, I felt like I wasn't taken too seriously as a youngster, and so starting this business is another opportunity to uh, increase my uh, ways to help people. There's innovations and things that I can do in order to help people solve their problems. It's not about the money for me. Poverty is a real horrible thing. People smoke cigarettes, and if they want to invest that money, if they smoke a pack a day, if they invested that money at 8% interest, they'd come up with a quarter million dollars by the time they got to retirement. Um, yeah, reading the Wall Street Journal, it goes into saying, uh, do you like reading the Wall Street Journal? There's very good information in there. Yeah, it says that uh, if the Cavendish uh, banana is going into, uh, it might become extinct because there's a couple different diseases against it. So they're, they've been uh, figuring out different ways to come up with uh, a new banana because if you look at apples, there's many different kinds, you know, Granny Smith, uh, the Pink Lady, uh, Red Delicious, but there's only the Cavendish uh, banana, so, and it's cloned, so it's very susceptible to disease, and so we're figuring out 
they have different ways in Australia. They're coming up with a, a banana. It is viable, but the taste isn't quite there. So uh, if we breed it out, we can hopefully get this uh, situation fixed mm -hmm. before we the banana becomes extinct. So like that, the roof coatings that my business does, it's aluminum. And if you look at the flat roofs, uh, it soaks up a lot of the heat from the sun. And so the AC is so expensive over the summertime with global warming coming up. And so uh, the aluminum is reflective on that. So if you mix it into the, the roof coating, it, it's a very, uh, it's a saturated market. So there's 600 different options you can have for the roof coating. And uh, if we, if I can develop, and I, I have been researching this, um, a way to put aluminum in the roof coating, we can lower the AC bills, and that will make everyone happier because uh, greenhouse gases are going green. So that's just a tip of the iceberg. Yeah, that's what. Uh, that's why I run this. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think I have a couple of reasons. Yeah. Well, my dad, um, it was his whole income. So my mom felt that was really important to mm -hmm. us. We didn't know that because my yeah. mom canned, um, had friends' gardens that she picked from. So we never saw have anything less. Mm -hmm. It was just we knew we had her consistently at home. Um, and so I attribute, um, he had to done door-to-door -door sales, which is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like that got me started, like for all the different skills of any job that I, mm -hmm. I've held. But then, since I'm a survivor myself, all the things that weren't available to me, I just wanted to make them all available together in one spot. Mm -hmm. And I just, I worked with like 32 different organizations when you, you deal with domestic. Wow. Well, number one, you're just not in the mindset for that. And that's just, you mm -hmm. have to keep track of that many phone numbers, mm -hmm. that many faces. Um, wow. And they never all come together in one place. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important that a survivor have like one spot. Mm -hmm. And we can sit on a phone call together and can listen in. Or um, we can all get on a joint like me and the client and mm -hmm. her attorney or therapist or tax person or whatever mm -hmm. can all get in an email together if need be. Mm -hmm. Just ways to make it, if they forgot about the conversation, yeah. if they were in a mind fog, they can go back to that email and know what all of us said or all of our names. Mm -hmm. I remember I forgot names a lot at yeah. that point in time. So that was just really important mm -hmm. to make something available. I started in COVID, which was crazy. Yeah. I thought, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. But it was important to me as well, from what I received as a child, to be available to my kids. So crazy enough, as a single mom, I stayed at home until all of them started in school. Mm -hmm. um, they had everything they needed. Yeah. I don't think I saw a new pair of shoes until mm -hmm. they were all in school. But it was so important to mm -hmm. me that I taught at SEC so I could take the classes I taught, mm -hmm. I could take the evenings I taught, yeah. and then I added, you know, one thing at a time. You have to always have two self-employed jobs or whatever, yeah. so that it always worked. So I never missed a parent-teacher conference. Mm -hmm. I never missed a game. That's us. Awesome. Overwork. Yeah. That was just, you know, oh, like you said, our generation. It was values mm -hmm. that people don't see anything wrong. Well, mm -hmm. I'll take this gig. You take that. Gig. Yeah. And I just never wanted that. I wanted mm -hmm. to, to include all of them so that they mm -hmm. all felt they were treated equally. That's cool. So more of, I guess, family and values. Yeah, I love values. that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I like that. All right, well, thank you, Olga. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It's been a um, pleasure. Before everybody leaves, we do have an announcement. Um, our team has made the decision that we are no longer going to host Perka. Um, we have really taken a look at it over the last couple months and assessed that um, maybe there are other things we can do um, for networking in the future. We don't know exactly what that is going to be. Um, but this has been in existence for 10 years uh. um, with the same format. And so we are always looking for innovation, 
looking for new ideas. So um, we will send out information to everybody on our email list, but we wanted to let everybody know that one's here, that Olga is our last. Oh my gosh, what an honor. <laughs> I'm um, so glad I got in yes, <laughs> at the yes, last absolutely. second. I'm glad you did too. Yeah. Um, so again, uh, we are always here for you. Uh, we always have been, and um, this will just not be the format that we will interact with you in the future. So, thank you all for your ongoing support of this event and the Entrepreneurship Center. So, we appreciate it. Wow. Well, we want to tell you thank you. Yeah. Because, I mean, I taught here and I was welcomed in as a suite owner, which to me is full circle. And then you did my strength finders. You guys gave me my like first or second speaking engagement. Um, so this really, for me, really got me started and got me excited. That's awesome. Um, three years later, I'm still at it. Yep. So that's huge. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Right. And Olga's here for yeah. conversation. Thank you for bringing treats to it. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Help yourself, you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Do you have business cards? Yeah. Oh, I might. I don't know. <laughs>